courtesy of Brad, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the Calgary Flames go into the All-Star break at 500. That's about all we can say that's good for this week. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, I don't think I've ever seen as much roster turnover in one week as we've seen this week. Yeah, you'd think that uh, some trades were made or something based on how much movement there's been. Six players have switched on the roster, but let's get back to that. Let's first talk about, and I really don't want to, but let's talk about the week that was. Oh, you're Calgary, not excited for the week of games that we played? I really, I really don't want to have to recap these. Like this yes. was a this was such a painful week. Three teams that the Flames should have been able to win. Three games that the Flames needed to win. I would say before we go into the All Star break, three games that the Flames had to show they can do this. And to be a top team, you not only have to beat the top teams, but you got to pick up those points when you can against bottom teams. And well. They weren't able to do that this week. So St. Louis Blues come into town and the Flames drop this one 4-3. Uh, Cole Schwint played his first game as a Calgary Flame. Not his first NHL game, but his first game as a Flame. This was not a great start for the Flames. I thought they were better after the second period, but that Blues goal late in the second really seemed to just take the wind out of them. Yeah, like the, the Flames were rolling and completely dominating the game up until that power play goal against or shorthand goal against and it, the team just stopped playing at that point and it just seemed inevitable that St. Louis would come back to tie the game and then they scored that weird late goal with like 45 seconds left on the clock and yeah not much you can do there as Dennis Gilbert said after the game when he talked to Pat Steinberg this was unacceptable yep definitely and, uh, like that that was a very poor performance like you need to be able to close out games period and well not only close them out but you got to be able to start them well too like the flames yeah like you said they were rolling at one point but it took them way too long to get started they wasted valuable time and then they couldn't close it out either no it just sloppy efforts all the way around so Hopefully, you know, we you sons you get sloppy efforts. Hopefully the next game they can win. And they took on the Columbus Blue Jackets. Johnny Goudreau came back to town. Still got booed when he had the puck. Um didn't do it here either. The Blue Jackets ended up winning five two over the Flames. Shillington was back. I guess that was probably the best part of this game. Oliver Shillington in the starting lineup. He last played six hundred and nine days before this game. Um I, you know, yes, there was some fluky goals, like the one off the ref, the first goal, but you can't be losing to Columbus 5-2. No, like realistically, the first two goals normally would not happen. Uh, you know, like Markstrom passing it right to Severson on the second that goal, was was, that was really not a good play. Um, yeah, and the Flames, to their credit, managed to tie the game shortly after the two, two goals given up by Markstrom. And then uh, they just kind of were there and didn't really do anything at all. And yeah, same story, shorthanded goal against to give them the lead and a power play goal on the third and an empty netter. And voila, you got a 5-2 loss to Columbus, losing the season series 2-0 to the Blue Jackets again. Like, it's like, these guys suck. You should be able to win against them. But four games in a row, they're nope. <laughs> After both these games, I had to enjoy from our friends at Bow River Brewing a YYC Calgary Pale Ale. Because I just, I I don't know. I was so upset after both these games. Yeah. Well, it, it seemed that, like, the team kind of... I you know it, it it seems that like the effort level overall from the team and uh, you know it the writing's on the wall like this team is going the path of a rebuild and you know like you can kind of see it in the effort levels in the game and the how intensely certain people are playing and very much coasting throughout most of the games Let's come back to that idea because we'll talk about that when we add in all the, the roster moves that have happened. Um, 
Chicago is the next team to come in. Another yep. team you can't lose to. Yeah. The 32nd ranked team in the league. And you beat them one nothing. And the worst part is that, yes, the Flames won. If it wasn't for their goaltender stand on their head, which you shouldn't have to do against the Blackhawks, they would not have won. No, like literally the only player in the game on either team that actually played well was Jacob Markstrom. Every other player on the Flames was absolute trash in this game. I thought this was the worst game of the season that this team's played by a mile. And like I have to go back to the 2013 or before that, the when the, the Flames traded Ole Jokinen to the New York Rangers and they had to play the Philadelphia Flyers that night. At, and everybody knew that Jokinen and Press were getting traded, but they still had to play the game. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That and was pretty That dumb. was the last time I saw a worse performance than what this was. February 1st, game. 2010. Yeah, like that. The, that's how bad this game was. It was absolutely pathetic. And even worse than that night was the fact we had to take on Alice Kodalik. Yes. Anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, this was the Flames were not good in the first. They were not good in the se in the first half of the second. I thought they got much better in the second half of this game, but they they still didn't like. Even though they got better, they didn't look the way they needed to. No, like their passing was horrendous. Their shot selection was bad. They couldn't get anything to work, and like if it wasn't for a bit of a fluky goal by Elias Lindholm, that might have gone to a zero-zero shootout. Like it, you know, like it. And was, that's it. Even the one goal the Flames scored was not like it was a great goal. It was kind of fluky. Yeah, like the goal he made to save, and it kicked over to the side of the net where there happened to be a Flames player just standing there. If Lindholm's not there, it it literally goes to overtime and. Flames probably lose <laughs> just based. And you know off what? If everything. Bedard was in the lineup, the Flames probably lose. Oh yeah, uh, I guarantee you, he would have scored at least one. Like it was pathetic. Uh, like that was, you know. I mean, yes, you get a shutout. Yes, you get a win. That's great. Those are wonderful things. But you know, the Chicago's twentieth straight loss on the road says something. You need to be able to beat this team more than one nothing. Yeah. If you think that you're a playoff team. No, and how would you say, like, uh, I actually was in the building for this one, and um, they showed uh, Lindholm getting interviewed uh, during the intermission after the goal, and, you know, the level of uh, energy he was projecting was below zero. <laughs> um, like, completely checked out and devoid of anything, and... You know, it, the writing is on the wall that, like, there are a bunch of players on this team that are not going to be here in a couple of weeks. And, you know, let Lindholm being front and center on that. And, you know, like, everybody knows it uh, with the losses to Toronto and Edmonton that they should have probably won um, last week. And then the two losses to St. Louis and Columbus. Like, the Flames have eight more points in the standings. We're a playoff team right now, but... You know. And I'm not getting where the lack of energy is coming from. Like they've been at home since, uh, let's call it the 13th, was was their last game on the road in Vegas. They've probably been home since the 14th. Like that's two weeks. You shouldn't be tired at this point. No. And it seems like the level of care by the team itself um, is down significantly. And uh, when A.J. Greer got hurt, like it seemed that like the compete level of the team also dropped significantly. Yeah. I'd even say before Greer, cause it wasn't there last week either. Yeah. But well, like you it, talked it wasn't, uh, even in the Edmonton game where like the, the flames were trying, it's just Edmonton did get a lucky bounce. And that was, you know, yeah. it was a more evenly balanced game between us and them. Yeah. I would say Toronto. I don't know if it was there. It, more so than this week. Like, it, it seemed like both those games, like, they were actually trying and they just didn't succeed. Like, this week, it did not look like they were trying at, you know, especially after uh, the 3 1 uh, shorthanded goal in St. Louis's game. Like, that was, like, the beginning of the end. Yeah, this was. Of all the games this week, the Chicago one made me the most upset. Yeah, even though we won, like, that was. As pathetic an effort of, as I've seen in a long, 
like 14 years, like a, a long time. <laughs> like yeah. we haven't even started the show yet. <laughs> like, <laughs> Matt, after this one, I hate to say it. I had two beers from our friends of over. <laughs> yeah. I had two high country Scottish Ambers after this one. Like this is, I, I don't normally drink after losses, but I was just so frustrated and upset this week. Oh, I know. Now I've got a week to dry out. Yep. <laughs> well, if we look at the standings again, so I really don't want to do at this point. Um, the wild card standings, LA is now in a wild card spot. They've dropped down because of Edmonton's winning streak at 54 points. St. Louis, 54 points. Nashville, 53. Seattle, 50. Arizona, 49. Calgary, 49. We are now sixth place in the wild card rankings. Minnesota's below us at 47. And then Anaheim, St. Louis, and Colorado lower than that. Like, you're almost as low as you're going to go without it being the bottom teams. Like, we know there's no way Minnesota, or sorry, there's no way Anaheim, San Jose, and Chicago are going to make the playoffs. Minnesota is two points down on us. They could very easily jump over us as well. Well, it, especially if you delete certain players off of this roster, like it, realistically, if you look at the league standings, the three teams from the West are on the bottom and then like two points up on Anaheim is Ottawa, two points on up on them is Columbus. And realistically, over the next like 33 games, uh, I could see the Flames getting passed by Columbus or Ottawa if they start moving out players sooner than later because... Like, you know, you, you start shedding the, you know, like Hannafin and Tanev and Lindholm, like that's a scary bad lineup <laughs> and, you know, like it's not going to be pretty and, you know. So what it, you're saying, Matt, is I need to go stock up on some more six packs from Bow River next week. Yeah, uh, get the ready to go rehab after the season. And <laughs> should, I, should I just get our? Should I just get you know? We, we, you and I know the tap room manager there. Should I just get him to give me a whole keg at this point? Like, yeah, just use it over the course of the season. Well, <laughs> man, what a crappy week to be a Flames fan. Yeah, even with one win, like the game I'm most upset about is the one they won, and that doesn't happen very often. No, and it, it and it's not because. Oh, we're cheering for a tank. No, they played so bad, we're both mystified how they actually walked away with the win. Like, you know, like, if we were not playing the Rockford Ice Hogs, like, we literally would have lost that game. Like, if well, we're... Ha I mean, we're pretty much the Wranglers, if you look at that lineup. True. The Wranglers with, you know, Coronado, or, uh, sorry, the Wranglers with uh, Markstrom and Net. Yeah, pretty much. Well... Let's move on to, I guess, other things like guys who don't have to put up with this anymore. Yes. Earlier that earlier this week, the Calgary Flames placed two players on waivers, Nick D. Simone and Adam Rajicka, same day. Both got claimed at the same time. Um, Nick D. Simone is off to New Jersey, and Adam Rajicka is off to Arizona. This was a puzzling move to me, and Matt, maybe you can, maybe you have some insights. Why do you put those two on waivers, and why do you put them on waivers at the same time? Well, realistically, you're wanting to bolster the uh, Calgary Wranglers for the playoffs. And, um, you know, if you sneak both of those guys through, then your farm team all of a sudden has two really dynamite players for the playoff run. I would, but even then, I uh, you, you've got thir they can only you've got thirty days of them going up and down. I don't see either of those guys. I mean, D Simone's been a top six this year. I don't see either of those guys going down and staying down. So why now? Well, and that's the thing. Like I would assume that both of those guys would remain down for the remainder of the season, or unless uh, like the Flames do trade off several defensemen. Well, I could have my, seen D that was I my first thought. Was there's got to be a trade coming? Yeah, and realistically, it's not the end of the world. Like, the Flames did actually open up two contract slots uh, by those two players leaving, so the Flames could technically take cap dumps or roster dumps off of other teams or uh, select players, like, to help the Wranglers. Like, you always hear of trades at the deadline where some random no-name AHLer gets dealt to some other team for future considerations. I'm assuming that the Flames will probably do that to bolster the Wranglers' chances yeah, for the playoffs. Yeah, and we, we've been on the receiving end of that a few times. Yeah, and I, I'll assume that, 
you know, like if you couldn't get Rajitska and D Simone down there, that you'll see them go the that route uh, in a month or so. I mean, okay, I can see maybe moving Rajitska down. He hasn't had a great season, but I think if you want to get rid of him, there's and maybe there's just no value on the market. But I can't understand why they would do it with D Simone. Like when you look at the the defensive side, Gilbert is the guy you don't want to lose. So you didn't lose Gilbert. I still think D Simone has been better than Osterly though. Like I don't know why you don't just put Osterly back down. Frankly, I think that due to experience that Osterly actually would have been the more likely guy to get claimed between D Simone and Osterly. Uh just cuz Osterly has a reputation and he's been around a lot longer than uh, D Simone has. So you're kind of I guess ho- I'm I'm kind of hoping that D Simone would sneak through and he didn't. And <laughs> How do you say it? it's splitting hairs at that point? Because with Shillington up, like Osterley or D Simone would be the number seven at that point, yeah. and it's not like it really matters that much. Like re- realistically, like when the trade deadline happens, and like assuming that Tanev and Hannafin both get moved, like you're likely to either see insert miscellaneous guy acquired join the lineup for sure but uh, i guess it's just it's still two two assets and especially with rajishka a younger asset who i think has some value that you're losing for nothing i don't think you get anything for i don't think you get anything on the trade market for d simone i could see a team willing to take a flyer not by himself but as a toss in on something for rajishka yeah honestly honestly you you'd have to look at like situationally where the flames are and you look at the, the team, and they're lacking offensive talent. And it, if this guy is not doing enough to actually break out of the fourth line on a team that has no offensive talent, it, to me, like, if I'm an opposing general manager, it's like, yeah, that guy must not be very good because they're literally auditioning anybody and everybody. And if this guy can't crack the fourth line then, you know, like, he might, must not be very good. And I can understand why Arizona took a flyer on him just because, you know, uh, they they did well with Valimaki when he first got there. I was going to say, they seem to love our waiver leftovers. You know, but uh, Arizona's also uh, quasi in a rebuild, too. So they're hoping that, you know, whatever magic, but... And remember, both those teams now have to keep those guys in their NHL roster, so they're confident enough in them that they're willing to keep yeah. them. And could I see either of those get it guys getting waived later this year? Sure. but And if they do, and you're Calgary, you take them back, right? Probably not. <laughs> you don't no, think so? honestly, I wouldn't bother. Interesting. I so, uh, Considering both of them are on a one-year, like you said, if you want to bolster your HL lineup, I would take them. Yeah, it, it, to me, it seems... How would you say neither guy did enough to stand out to be more than a that's true. Yeah, you're there. Like, you know, that's like true. honest. And, and that's been the biggest knock on Rajishka too, right? Like, you know, as much as I'm defending him, he's been horribly inconsistent. As a no, fan. like when he's on, he's actually a legit top six forward, which we saw briefly at the beginning of last season. Then he got demoted slightly and then he vanished and he has never returned. And, you know, it's one of those... W- they can find yeah, better. It, it's one of those where, like, insert miscellaneous fourth liner, you're going to get basically the same from that guy as you did, would Rajitska. So it's, you know, it's disappointing because you always like to have your own draft picks pan out and, like, be long-term members of your organization. But it's one of those where, like, especially if the Flames are going into a rebuild, you need to quickly identify guys that are good or not and run with it because you're going to be creating a lot of roster spots in the near future. Yeah. I mean, I'm not opposed to them losing either guy. Cause like you said, they're not huge parts of the team. I'm just trying to figure out why they waived them now. Like it just, the timing of the waiver move was odd to me. And I was expecting right away, like, okay, there's some sort of trade coming. Um, but without that, it just, I don't know, it seems like an odd move to make. Well, and I, I think that, that this is also partially to, A, try out guys like Schwint, etc. And Klapka, and all those kind of guys. Give them a little bit of a shot. And then, you know, like, I'm under the assumption that, like, if they move Lindholm or 
Hannafin, uh, that they're going to be getting young players back. And so try out some guys for like a week or two. And if they cut it, that's good to know. Or they get to learn like, okay, this is where I need to go from here forward. Kind of like the last game of the season where you throw miscellaneous guys in to train for next year. But then, you know, have the spots available for, you know, player X, player Y, player Z in the random acquisitions, whatever they may be in a couple weeks. Yeah, you could be right. And because of that, like you said, we saw three players brought up from um, the Wranglers. Adam Klapka made his NHL debut. Walker Dewar came back after going down. Cole Schwint yep. came up, not making his NHL debut. He played in Florida, but making his Calgary debut. And Matt Coronado came back up as well. Um, and all those guys got returned, I think, except they Dewar. did. Yeah, they got. And I'm surprised Dewar didn't get returned because he's he's uh, eligible to go down. Could still. Yeah. And then I think Klapka's not going to come back. He got benched after the after that one penalty in the Chicago game. He only played five shifts in the first. I think the coach wasn't happy with him no it's like it's one thing like if you're um doing something on the positive end of the game uh to help your team but you know he took a couple of penalties in his time in there and kind of looked a little overmatched at times and it's one of those things where you know it you have to learn at the AHL level, you know, and like, it's a good lesson for those guys to go back and, you know, know like, okay, this is what I have to do. And I'm sure that like each of the guys are getting their own little report card and like, okay, work on this stuff. I and, also think yeah. that with Peltier and Rooney likely available when the team comes back from the all-star break, I don't think you keep say Schwint and uh clap up here. I think you'll probably bring, Rooney and Peltier instead. Yeah. And I would assume that they would play Rooney specifically um, just because of there being a couple of weeks between then and the trade deadline. And he is a free agent after this season. So, you know, teams might say like if he's playing adequately as a fourth line player that, you know, that's a relatively cheap acquisition, yeah. you know, like a seventh round pick and the flames might be able to trade him and also, you're now short of center, too. Like, you know, I kind of expected the Rajichka move to happen. I just didn't expect it now. I expected it when Rooney was ready. Um, it just seemed a little premature. But I think Rooney just slots into the the, the uh, Rajichka yeah. spot. And, you know, it, it's one of those where the whole situation is just kind of tough and in flux. Like, honestly, I, would Rajichka have been waived had the Greer injury happened one game earlier? No. It's just bad timing, and there's not much you can do about that. And <laughs> You mentioned last week, and I agreed with you, that Matt Coronado looked a little bit out of his element. I thought this week he looked much better. Yeah, still a little bit out of his element, but better. It, it, you know, and it, it's one of those where it's going to take him a while to adjust, and like I would not really expect him to play much the rest of the season up here um but you know it, it's one of those where like next year i'm expecting him to really fight to make the team out of camp and like he, he has improved significantly since the start of the season it's just he's still got a ways to go yeah and i think if you're kind of if you've got that one spot on your wing in the top nine for a you know a young stud i think it's going to go to peltier this year yeah, I agree. And I just, with Peltier coming back, I don't see where both Coronado and Peltier fit in the lineup right now. No. So I think, you know, it'll be Peltier coming in and Coronado. And again, it's okay. I think he's, the better place from right now is in the American League. Yeah, there's absolutely no need to rush anybody. And, you know, you do what works for this team in the long term. It's not a... Like, you know, we have to be in the playoffs next season type thing. Like, it, take your time, do it right, and let these guys grow as a team and, you know, go from there when, when and if needed. 
And then you mentioned a few times AJ Greer, um, one of the best, I'd say one of the best parts of the Flames lineup this year, who they acquired on waivers from Boston at the beginning of the year, really messed up his foot in the, what was that? That was the second game of the week. That was the Columbus game. Um, and he's going to be out for eight weeks with a fractured foot. So for all intents and purposes, pretty much out for the rest of the season. Yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is that when that happened, I was actually, like, hoping that if it was an injury, that it would be a broken bone. Because that looked like it could have easily been the tendon tear or a nasty sprain, which, it, you know, anybody that's been through that those kind of things will tell you that you always would rather break it and because it will heal faster and better uh, over the long term than sprains, which can drag on for months and months before it feels normal or a tendon tear, which can be like a full year before you're back. Yeah. And a guy like AJ Greer, the team is not going to rush back in the lineup. They'll bring him back when he's ready. No. And like, realistically, like that is a player that, could have potentially been traded at the end of the And I bet there would, like, I kind of expected Greer to go. I think there'd be value for him this year, even if it's a fifth round pick. Yeah. And, the you know, depending on teams, like, they might even trade him even for him, even though he's injured. But, you know, he would definitely be a player that I would be very happy if he came back next year. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I, I think the Flames hoped that Adam Klapka could step into his role. And so far, it doesn't look like he has. No. So, three guys out with Simone out, uh, Greer out, or sorry, D. Simone out, Rajishka out, Greer out. Three new guys in with Klapka, Schwint, and Coronado. I guess Dewar has kind of played back and forth. As you mentioned, probably, you know, this may be the last time. You you mentioned that we'll see trades in in the next couple weeks. I think this might be the last time that we see this Flames team together. I don't know about you. I would not be surprised if coming back after their one-week break, and I don't know if the team is allowed to make trades during that break, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see one move at least happen during this break. Well, I I do believe there is a roster freeze for a good portion of that, but I think that any of the groundwork uh, for laying down the particulars and trades will be hammered out. And like shortly after the roster freeze, because, you know, I think that the team's getting a little bit of a wake up call with uh, the Greer injury that, hey, uh, best not to mess around too much and move these guys sooner than later. So, you know, because like the last thing that this team would need, uh, Lindholm or Hannafin getting hurt or Tanev and, you know, with a similar timeline uh, that they're on the shelf and, you know, like there goes the trade value of that asset. So I think that the team's going to probably get this stuff done sooner than later. And I think too, if you're like half the leagues on bye week when we are, and then half of them coming back, I have to imagine if you're Craig Conroy, you're probably talking heavily to those GMs that are on the bye week the same time as you, or even going to the all-star game, talking to guys. Cause what else have you got to do for that week? Exactly. And, you know, it, it's one of those where the, the team has a lot of different things that they need to do in a very short period of time. And, you know, like the, there's, you know, like guys that are have one year left on their deal, guys that are free agents, uh, the goaltending situation, like all of these things need to have clearer answers over the next month. And... You know, it, it's one of those where, you know, and, and then you also have situations where certain players might ask for trades too. You know, like there's a lot of things that are up in the air for this team right at the moment. And, you know, it, it's going to be a lot. And we'll see over the next month exactly how everything shakes out. But I'm expecting that many moves will happen very quickly. And,. Basically, like the only guys that I feel that are untouchable are the uh, two defensemen, Anderson and Uyghur, uh and the two forwards, Blake Coleman and Igor Sharangovich. And then everything else is no holds bar at this point. I think you and I are going to have a busy February, Matt. Yep. Um, I guess looking at this, looking at where the team's at, 
you and I have been saying, you know what, there's a right way and another way this year. I mean, we could, you and I both said we could see a scenario where management or ownership or somebody didn't want to go through the rebuild, wanted to try and run for the playoffs and see if they can do it and stay in that mediocrity that Calgary has been in for so long. At this point, you have to move in the rebuild direction, right? Like there's, to me, there's no choice at this point that you don't. And I think if you don't, you're, I mean, if you're Craig Connery, even if that's the way you're seeing, this is the thing, if that's the way your owner wants to go. But I think if not like this, this organization is done for a long time. Yeah. Like realistically, like if you don't get multiple firsts in the trade for those three guys or first equivalents. Yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah, I'm still not expecting they just trade for draft picks. No, but they should get some draft picks, whether it's first, second, thirds. Um, but, you know, it's one of those, you know, like say, like if you traded Lindholm to Vancouver, you could get a guy like Nils Holglander, uh, who's a decent, you know, mm-hmm. guy and, and like a second or third round draft yeah, pick. Yeah, we've heard, we've heard the name Bo Byram, Bo and Byram out of Colorado a number of times. We we won't get into trade rumors today. Um, yeah, and some... like the New York Rangers, uh, Philip Schittel, uh he uh, got uh, hurt and he's out for the rest of the year with the concussion at, in, you know issues. So that you know, and it's one of those where you know, like he's their second line center, and mm-hmm. you know he makes only like seven hundred thousand dollars less than Lindholm. So it's one of those where like that would be a good fit for them, especially because they're going for the cup this year. Um, yeah, it, it's going to be, you know, like there's many suitors, like there's going to be about 15 teams that are going to be interested in Elias Lindholm or a Noah Hannafin or a Chris Tanev. So just so from the way I'm reading this and I'm just reading the rule book here while you're talking, it sounds like the flames do have a roster freeze until the 4th of February, which is a Sunday, the day after the All-Star game. Their next game is the 6th on the road. I think if you're going to make a deal, you make it before you load up for the jet on the 5th. Yeah. So, like you said, I could see maybe having something done and we don't fax it to the league until the 4th. Yeah, as soon as the roster freeze is done. Like, honestly, would I be surprised if, uh, like, any of those three have played their last game as a flame? No. You're not going to see all three move, but I would be I would be really surprised if we come back on the fourth of February, um, or even if you know by the eighth when we do our trivia night with our fans, and we have the same Calgary Flames roster in place. Yeah, and then it, then it gets into okay, when is the shoe going to drop, and are you going to start holding players out from playing in those games? Because yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, teams now, I mean, you and I can look around this league. We know who's a viable contender and who's not. You're not waiting on that. If you're waiting on the money, okay. But, you know, generally we see a big deal done two, three weeks before the trade deadline. There's always that first one where we go, okay, the markets are open. Well, and, and I the, think the thing is that normally, like when players get dealt uh, like late at the deadline, it's because like they're a seven, eight, nine, ten million dollar player. All of our guys are in the four million dollar range, and that's yep. where you know it makes it a lot easier for teams because they don't, even if like they're wanting to throw a contract back, like they don't have to throw a big one back yeah. in order to equalize salaries, and like it makes it very easy for those teams to be able to eat whatever. Um, yeah. And often as a GM, you want to get ahead of the market because you want to establish the price instead of following the market. And we see this all the time at the deadline where one guy moves and then a similar player moves, you know, 20 minutes later. And it's like, well, he's not as good as that guy. So he's not getting that much or, oh, we didn't know he was going to be worth that much. Okay. Now our guy's worth even more. So if you're taking from Calgary, you probably want to get your, your work done early. So you can establish that market. Yeah. And especially like the Flames have uh, a lot of different players, um, you know, and like you look at like uh, Tanev, the best comparison to him is Ben Sherratt. And, um, you know, he returned to first plus uh, a couple years ago, uh, traded uh, from Montreal to Florida. And, you know, like there are basically all of the teams that are in the top 10 could use another good defenseman like a Tanev. So, 
you know, like that kind of a deal is available. So oh, yeah, that that deal had all sorts of conditions on it. I'm remembering. Yeah, that was Ben Chirot was traded to Florida, half his salary retained. Montreal got Tyler Smalinik, a fourth and a first with conditions that the it just kind of whoever gets what and you know the higher the fourth that sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, no, that was I remember there was a lot of conditions on. Yeah, that. it wasn't quite Monahan. Uh, trade level no. of conditions but it was close i still th- i know that that monahan deal was done the day the tree was moving his daughter into res at university i still think he put the conditions on so he didn't have to move furniture it's like dad's on the phone yeah i i gotta really hammer this out that's right and make this document at least 20 pages long so that way i cannot do anything all day <laughs> Yeah, that, that is it. I think that's the most conditions Flames ever put on a trade. I like, think that's the most conditions any team has ever put on a trade. If Monaghan scores on a Tuesday, we get a third. But if he scores his final goal with the Leafs on a, or with the Canadians on a Sunday, we get a, a ninth round pick. And yeah, uh, it, we, it, yeah, yeah, it, it's long. <laughs> it is. Yeah, no, it's it's kind of crazy. Um, but you know, on the other side, I could see the Flames being the receiver of a Monahan like deal this year. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, realistically, in the off season, especially because the Flames will be one of the few teams that can actually play to the cap, um, and they will have a lot of money available. That you know, there is, are going to be a number of teams that are in cap hell, even with the cap going up. That you know. Hey, you know, throw a pick and let's have some fun. Yeah, and we'll talk more about the the trade deadline when we get closer to uh, March. But I can totally see, and we see this. We seem to have seen this the last couple of years. I was looking back at past trade deadlines. There's always some weird three way deal where one team is just being used as a broker for a player, and I can totally see the Flames being involved in one of these weird three way deals this year. Yeah, just uh, you know, flip the guy there so that way they can retain salary and then. Flip him on to wherever. Yeah. So, Matt, taking a look at the you know the players the Flames have brought up this week, taking a look at all the things we just talked about, do you think it's fair to say going into this all-star break, this is the start of the rebuild? Oh, for sure. And, like, realistically, the Flames are sixth in the wild card. Like, they're not going to leapfrog four teams, especially with how they're playing yeah, you know, and like they they've got quite a number of good teams that they're coming up against in the near term and you know like the writings on the wall that you know like it's not like you're hearing oh so and so's been re-signed for x years at x dollars you know like if you all of a sudden saw Hannafin signing like an 88 deal you know, then you might go, well, hey, maybe this team is actually sticking with it. But And I think if you're Conroy, you're telling Hannafin, go away for a week, figure this out. I need to know when you get back if you're in or out. Yep. Like, I bet Conroy's giving him an offer, saying, take this offer, mull it over while you're in Mexico, wherever he's going to be. Um, you know, and when you get back, I need to know if you're in or out. Yep, because he would definitely be a player that, it, you know, if they re-signed him, great. But, and I think if you're going to re-sign him, you almost want him re-signed right away. And, you know, let everybody kind of know, hey, Hannafin's in for the long run. Yeah. And we'll see. I'm not really concerned one way or the other. Like, they will get fair value for him if they move him or they'll re-sign him, which, oh, no, we have a top-pairing defenseman for the next eight years. Oh, no. So... so- Matt, we'll officially call it here. Uh, it's the 28th of January, 2024. The rebuild starts now. Yep. Like, I think with, you know, even starting to look at the call-ups, Klapka, you know, Schwint, Coronado, Dewar, like the Flames are starting, you know, getting rid of two guys because I guess they can in a way. Like, you know, I think that we're well, starting and freeing to... Well, re- up the, the roster spots on the, in yeah. terms of contracts, that I do believe helps quite a bit uh, just because... Like, how would you say, if you're trading Lindholm, you're likely going to get two players back, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, and whether they're NHL or AHL guys, like, you're going to probably get, like, an NHL replacement player plus, like, a prospect in in addition to a draft pick. Same thing with Hannafin. 
and you need to be able to actually equalize out contracts at that point because you're only allowed 50 so yeah and depending on what happens here in the next week or so the flames may have another roster spot open up from dylan dubay yeah um we're not gonna go there we nothing's finalized there yet but uh yeah yeah i mean if if a contract ends up getting terminated which i very much could see it happening yeah um th they could free up another rush spot there yeah and like that would be the easiest decision you know possible and like we saw ottawa uh not even uh tender a contract to alex formanton uh, who was actually uh officially yeah, he, charged today so yeah well yeah he's if he i don't think he's been charged yet but he's surrendered to london police so so but i mean you know not tendering a contract and having a guy under contract is different and i think that you know calgary philly and new jersey are all gonna have to talk to the league and see what to do there but um you know they all i'm saying is there could be a third rough spot open up as well yeah um, so yeah, I think, I think coming out uh, back off, I think we need to recalibrate our expectations coming off this all-star break and we need to start looking at this is the start of the rebuild. We're going to see more younger players. Like you said, even if they're not traded, I think some of our top assets are going to play less minutes to protect them from injury. I think we're going to see guys who maybe haven't played as much get pushed higher up the lineup. Like I'm expecting almost a a complete flip in the mentality of this team. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see. And, you know, like it's a prime opportunity for every player involved to, you know, make a name for themselves at the NHL yeah. level. And like, would I be surprised over the next month if you didn't see like the rest of the prospects that are kind of that the bubble to the wranglers yeah like the guys like patterson or uh, ben jones getting called up just to give them a game or two as well i could definitely see that just to mm -hmm. give everybody a shot at some nhl games because why not uh, you know free teaching tool <laughs> you know because hey you, you want to get there yeah, at the same time, though, I mean, the, the Wranglers are really decimated right now. They may need to keep guys there just for bodies. Well, and that's the thing. Like, I think you'd cycle through, like, sending guys like Klapka back down, recalling Patterson, that kind of thing, and, like, change out who you're bringing up and just kind of cycle through everybody so that way, you know, everybody has a, sh a shot at it and go from there. So that way... Frankly, especially heading into the off season and next year, where it's actually more important for these players to know, um, giving everybody a shot at the NHL level, I think, becomes even more important because you can do that without the restriction of the recalls at the end of the season because you're only allowed four. Yeah. So if you do it beforehand, you can kind of get away with you know cycling like all of your guys. <laughs> and so, yeah. And at the, at the same time though, I mean, yeah, we'll see if the flames are bringing back bodies, there might be some cap gymnastics going on there, but we'll, we'll see what happens as those trades start to get made. Yeah. So the flames now take a break. They do not play again until the 6th of February. They are on their, uh, all-star break. And I guess their bye week as well. We have the, it feels like we've always had the early bye week. Yeah. Um, like there's always two bye weeks and I can't remember a time we've been on the, after the all-star bye week. It seems like we're always on the first one. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, just to go through like the guys that might be candidates for a recall, uh, guys like Patterson, Ben Jones, Rory Karens. Um, I don't think you bring Karens up yet. Yeah. And then guys like uh, maybe Stromgren, uh, Soloviev, Kuznetsov, Poirier, if he's uh, healthy, but that'll probably be later, and that's basically it. So, You know, I've said this name before. If the Flames are looking for sort of a fourth-line center or a 13th forward, I could see Clark Bishop getting a recall. Yep, that too. You know, he's a seasoned guy. You don't want a young guy sitting on the bench or in the press box, but... If you need that guy, I could see Bishop getting that call because mm -hmm. Alex Gallant is not under Flames deal, so it couldn't be him. But yeah, I could see Bishop getting that call. Yep. So Matt, I guess the next event for the Flames is the All Star Game this year. It's in Toronto. We know Elias Lindholm will be there. Are you watching the All Star Game? <laughs> no. <laughs> Are you watching the skills competition? Not really. No. 
Do you care? Not one bit. <laughs> Me neither. I, when I was a kid, I loved the All Star Game. Yeah, and, and I that, that is year. really what it's for. It, you know, like it was really fun when we were kids. You know, like seeing guys like Ray Bork and Al McKinnis, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, puck shooting accuracy things or the hardest shot. You know, and yeah, like it. it it was fun then, but frankly, like basically a after they stopped doing like the East West matchups, which you have to pretty much go back to like 2003. North America versus the world was stupid. Yeah. Like the 2003 all-star game in Minnesota, I feel was like the last quote unquote normal, um, all-star game. And then after that, it just kind of seemed to, get worse and worse over time and like especially after they've gone to three on three it's just unwatchable garbage you know and i saw this week that uh, the ottawa senators actually did their own skills competition in their building they brought in some of the pwhl players like we saw years ago the flames do the the denon skills competitions here to me that's what i want to see as a fan i really don't care about the rest of the league i want to see the flames do their skills comp and now that you have the wranglers here why don't we have both teams compete together yeah like, that's the kind of thing I yeah. think if you're a kid. Well, and, hey, you can have them switch jerseys halfway through. Cause there you go. You know, hey, you've been um, recalled. <laughs> yeah, go to the bench, flip your jersey inside out, and now you're on the other team. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yep. <laughs> as a fan, it's expensive to go you know, to Toronto if you're a Calgary kid. And why not have that here? Like, the Flames seem to have abandoned some of that stuff, and I don't know why. The All-Star game, the other thing, too, when I was a kid, I knew the name of everybody on the All-Star team. Like, I could tell you both the West and East rosters when I was a kid for a couple of years. This year, I'm looking at the roster. I don't know who half these guys are. No. Uh, and, you know, like, it was relatively easy. Like, you had guys like your yep. Borks, your Shanahan's, your Forsberg, Sackick, Wah. You know, you just go through. And I think it says something about the dilution of the league, yeah. too. Well, frankly, like, there are only about, like, seven or eight players in the NHL that are of the same caliber as those guys. You know, like, I don't think that the talent level of the NHL overall is anywhere near as good as it was, uh, like, 30 years ago. But, it, you know, guys like Crosby, McDavid, and Ovechkin, definitely. But, like, past that, eh, not so much. <laughs> you know, I, I'm i not a huge fan of the of the World Cup idea. But I was thinking about this today. I would much rather if they want to do an in-season tournament instead of the all-star game, do a best on best world cup style. Yeah. Yeah. Like how they used to you do know. like the Canada cup, but like do it during the season, take like a couple yeah. weeks off, have, you know, sort of like the Olympics were yep. done. And the NHL also like, I don't know, it has fanfare, but it just seems like it's, fanfare within its own little bubble. Like I remember as a kid, there was a year that they did at McDonald's, the Muppets characters were in NHL jerseys. And it's like, I've still got those somewhere animal and his Western conference Jersey and yeah. Kermit. Those were awesome. And like now nobody outside the NHL bubble seems to care. It's like, you know, we're amusing ourselves in a way where I think before when you had all those marketable names, they're trying to market it to, the North American audience. Well, and frankly, like, you look like 15 years ago, like, the NHL and NBA were more or less even in terms of popularity, interchangeable. And, you know, the NBA, to their credit, really marketed their stars well and were very effective at making them brands of their own. And, you know, like, now the NBA is closing in on the major league baseball, which baseball's also seen a resurgence and like the NHL has basically stood pat the whole time. And, you know, like frankly, unless you're a hockey fan, like nobody knows even who McDavid is like, you know, like some people would know Crosby and Ovechkin cause they've been around forever, but you know, like any of the younger players, like if you asked like some random American who Leon Dreisaitl is, they'd be like, what the what? <laughs> and even then, if they're if we're doing it for ourselves as a hockey community, I'm okay with that. But I'm I don't understand who we're trying to appeal to this year. Why do we need Justin Bieber, Will Arnett, Tate McRae, and Michael Bublé involved? Like 
if you're trying to get the outside audience involved, maybe Buble, maybe Tate McRae, but I, I don't know. Like it, I'm not quite sure who they're trying to appeal to with this thing. And it just, it, it feels more silly than anything. Yeah. And then them ripping off Carl's Jr. <laughs> you know, doesn't help. And well, and I don't care the Bieber, you know, like, Again, why do we care that Bieber made the jerseys? Like, is anybody going to go, wow, I'm a Bieber fan? And like, if Taylor Swift made the jerseys, women would go buy them. Like, I don't think Taylor Swift, or I don't think that Justin Bieber has this Taylor Swift effect. Like, who cares? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, there's only a handful of people that you'd actually get somebody actually caring that did not. And, yeah, it... it like... I'm curious how many people are going, I wasn't going to buy an all-star jersey, but Bieber designed it. Take my money, Gary Bettman. Like, it, it, the whole thing just seems stupid. Yeah, kind of. Um, unless you had, like... You buy every jersey known to man. Are you going to buy one? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, I did buy the one uh, all-star uh, jersey, um, the San Jose year, uh, when they had, like, the gray and white uh, for our division. But okay. uh, it was the year that Riddick was uh, an all-star. I didn't get his, but, you know, it was. And even last year, like, they went back to the old kind of star from the 90s. Like, I love that. That was the classic all-star yeah. look to me. I know. 2020 was stupid when they had the lines through them all. Like, they've just, the whole thing's gone very silly. Yeah. It's either, like, do something very unique or... You know, very retro, like it, where it's like classic NHL All Star jersey. You know, or or just play best on best five on five without any gimmicks. Yeah, that too. Like I don't want a three on three tournament. That's not what hockey is. I don't oh. want celebrities. I don't want silly jerseys. Like just give me you know the best on the best. Yep. And I, I could see in the future maybe doing something with the PWHL. Like, I think it'd be cool if we had a weekend of all-star hockey. So if they had the NHL all-star game, the HL all-star game, the PWHL all-star game, all in one weekend. Like, you know, even in, M in the MLB, they have the young they have the upcoming stars game, the young stars game. Like, you know, I could see doing something like that or even having like, you know, old guys versus young guys, like a team of under 25 and over 25, but play it five on five. Like, I don't know the, it just, every year it seems like more gimmicks. Yeah. It's not very good. Like, and frankly, like the NHL does a really poor job of selling their players and they do like, it doesn't help that, you know, frankly, a guy like McDavid is like, the least entertaining personality possible for a superstar. But, you know, like you have to find ways of, you know, embracing the actual players that you have. Like you look in major league baseball, which is not very good at marketing their stars. You still know who like Aaron judge or Vlad Guerrero, but even in, even in the MLB, I find more people are interested in the home run derby than the yeah. game. And I'd even be okay if the NHL did the skills comp and called it a weekend. Yeah. Oh, I know. Do the skills comp off for a million dollars or something for the winner of each category. And you know what? We're done. Like a lot of these guys, you know, are either coming back from or starting their, their bye week. Just give them the weekend to be with their family. Like, you know, I, I don't know. I, well, well, it's the whole like, thing uh, seems Crosby, silly to me. I do believe is playing in only his sixth all-star game because, you know, like he just would skip it. <laughs> And it's like, yeah. uh, you know, like it, it's that kind of stuff where, like, frankly, like it, it shows how poorly the NHL markets its stars where, you know, like one of the top 10 players to ever play the game, you know, literally has only shown up for six of these in his career because who cares? The NHL has also trained us that things that are outside are special. Put it yeah. outside. Uh, I would love it if they did an outdoor all-star game. Like that would be actually something worth watching, but, and like, you know, even when we've had the outdoor games, the part that I love the most those weekends is the alumni yeah. games. Like when we've had, you know, they, we didn't do one this year, but like the Calgary Edmonton alumni, like, I don't know, put an alumni game in here, get 
old guys like if you had Gretzky and Messier and some of those guys lace it up again with younger all stars, you know, you got Jerome, you got guys like that. People, would, I'd watch. Oh, them. I know. Like it was fun seeing uh, Mike Vernon uh, playing in that uh, one when we played against Montreal. Like it yeah. was fun. Or even if you had like the NHL all stars against the Hall of Famers, like. You know, there, there's so many things you could do that would be more entertaining than the crap they've given us for the last handful yep. of years. And again, even if the NHL isn't, do it here. Like, do our own skills comp. Get, you know, the Wranglers take on the Flames alumni or something. Like, I, I'd go see that. I want to see Jerome light up Oscar Dansk, like, or even Wolf. Like, you know, I, I'd go see that. Yeah. Why not? Get Jelena back on the ice. I mean, if you, if you were the Calgary Flames and you did your own event and you got the as much of that 4 roster together as you could, and you put them either against the Flames or even against the well, Wranglers. you know, like you especially look at this year, it's literally the 20th anniversary of that year. You yeah. know, like, the, frankly, I think that's a lost opportunity by the Flames, especially with Kipper's jersey being retired this year, that you could have made it a theme of the whole season of, yeah. You know, celebrating that run and have, you know, exactly all those and kind NHL, of ideas. And and all the other sports you've mentioned, I know people that are fans of the sport. I know very few people are fans of the NHL. Everyone has their tribalism. And I'll be honest, I don't care about the all-star from St. Louis or from, you know, New Jersey or from Winnipeg or any other. I care about my team. Like, you know, let's maybe the way to do it is just do your own thing. Do some sort of all-star thing in your own market. Yeah. Or partner, like if Calgary Edmonton wanted to partner for something, great. Um, but, you know, do something within your market of people that care about yeah. you. Yeah, it, it's just bland. <laughs> I'm also trying to figure out if the celebrity captains this year pick players. That's not generally a captain's job. Shouldn't they be the celebrity general managers then? True. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to need another... I'm going to need another drink after this one. I'm going to see if I got any Bow, Bow River Brewing stuff in the fridge. Cause I just, the, the all-star game gets me hot for some reason. I don't know why it's just, it, it's it such a squandered like op. It's a mockery of our yeah, great it's game. It's such a squandered opportunity. Like it's a prime example, you know, and like even the, the skills competition has gone flat as well. And like there, there's just nothing captivating or interesting about anything anymore. And, it's just bland and boring and it, it, you know, it's when it shouldn't be. And yeah, it just sucks. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. It just sucks. Well, something that doesn't suck is uh trivia night coming up. You and I are going to be a bow river brewing on the 8th of February. This is going to be the last time that we promote this because we won't be doing a show next week with the bye week So, Make sure you write on your calendar the 8th of February. Join us at Bow River Brewing. The Flames will take on the New Jersey Devils that night. The game starts at 5. During the intermissions, Matt and I are going to be hosting Flames Trivia. So come on out. Get yourself registered. Uh, first intermission, second intermission, the game will continue. We got a prize pack for the winner with some beer from Bow River, some things with from Fireside Chat, and some Flames stuff that we have as well. We'd love to meet you all. We'd love to hang out. We'd love to watch the game. Maybe we're going to see some very different players in this roster by then you never know and if not let's uh let's fantasy book let's be together and be the fantasy gm and figure out what the flames should do to solve this problem by then the, our friends of bow river are going to give us some great uh, deals six bucks for a beer you can't get that anywhere else especially tap beer and 13 dollars for pizza if you come out so on the 8th come on out if you want some more details you can find them firesidechat.ca in the navigation at the top you'll see trivia night or on Facebook, we have an event at facebook.com slash fireside chat. So, Matt, I would not be surprised if we go in there and, uh, as we talked about, very different field of this yeah, team. Yeah, and it would be definitely a lot of fun to debate uh, people on, like, their thoughts on returns, who should go, who should stay, what they should do. Yeah. We're... Matt and I will be there for the whole game, so come on out. We'll be there right from the beginning to the end. We'll be doing our trivia, like I said, during the intermissions, but we're happy to chat with you. We're happy to debate with you, whatever you want to do while the game's going on. So come on out. Come hang out. It'll be a great night. Everyone that came out uh, for the last one we did had a fun time, and this time with the Flames trivia and some stakes on it should be good. I promise you. There will be questions everybody can answer. It's not like you got to be a Flames nerd to play. So trivia. who is the fourth and line can... center on the Calgary Flames in 1982, 
Nothing like that. I will tell I'll tell everybody now, as long as you know the name of the horse logo, you'll get at least one right. Um Blazy? So no. <laughs> you Scorch, yes. right? That's his name. Um you you can come and hog all the glory and play solo. You can grab your line mates and play as a team that night if you want to have multiple brains working together. Or come on out, meet some new friends, and then make a team with people you're there for. It's a great time to meet some new Flames fans, hang out. Like I said, if you say, oh, I know a little bit about the Flames, so does my brother, my friend, bring them out. Make a team together. We want to see who's going to win, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun to, to play and to hang out. And I think to come back after this break as well. Yeah. And it'll be something interesting to talk about uh, over the next few weeks as well. So, Matt, uh, we will not have a show next week on the 4th. The Flames are going on the All-Star break, and you just heard us dump on the All-Star game, so we're not going to do a whole show just for the game that neither of us are going to watch. Yeah, and mock it just, you know, in absentia. <laughs> so the, the next time, if you don't come to Trivia Night, the next time you will hear us will be the 11th of February. If something changes, uh, we might have some guest spots or things like that we'll put on the feed, but the next new Fireside Chat show will be the 11th. Um, so check us out then. Everybody enjoy your break. But Matt, we've got three games to predict before we come back, and these are the three games after that break. So as we talked about earlier, the 6th, they're on the road, 5 p.m. start time against Boston. The 8th, they're on the road, 5 p.m. start time against New Jersey. That's the one that you and I will be doing trivia during. The 3rd, or sorry, the 10th, an 11 a.m. start time in New York. This is the f three of the four games on that Eastern road swing. Yeah, to play the Islanders specifically. Yeah. Um, let's Before we go there, neither of us did well last week. You... Uh, I, I thought, got the right point total, but the wrong teams. Right point total. You thought we'd beat St. Louis and lose to Columbus, Chicago. I thought we'd beat St. Louis, Columbus, lose Chicago. I'm going three losses this time. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, I mean, I as, as much as that pains me to go, okay, we've had a week. The team's ready. I think they're going to get their teeth kicked in in that first week. Yeah, I will go opposite you on one game just so that we don't have the exact same but i agree 1000 percent with you uh, i will say that they'll beat boston just for the lulls if they actually do <laughs> see then they beat boston they lose to new jersey and they lose to uh the islanders i think they're gonna get smoked in all three to be perfectly honest but just to not have the exact same thing as you all run with that there's been some talk from insiders that the flames new jersey might be doing a deal so that new jersey game could be very interesting if we end up playing against some of our guys. Um, I think it's also funny if we're doing all our major deals, like we send them to Foley, we send them to somebody else, we're just swapping players between those two. Yeah. Here's Markstrom. Here's Lindholm. Here's Antana. That's right. You know, have fun. Matt, it pa you don't know how much it pains me to say three losses after this break. Yeah. Oh, I know. Me too. And yet... Yeah. You know, the mind cannot say anything different. Like, all three of those teams are good. They're playing well, and they're fighting for their playoff lives or for first in the conference, where Calgary is circling the drain. And, and for years, Calgary looked terrible after the break. Like, it, for a couple of years, they would just shut down after that break. They didn't do too bad last year, but I still think... These guys, I think, are going to come back with a lot of pressure on them. I think they're all going to feel some pressure, and I think they're going to succumb to that pressure. Yeah, like, you realistically look at uh, the, you know, the standings, and um, the Islanders and the Devils are just outside of the playoffs uh, by four and five points, respectively, although they have a number of games on hand on the Flyers, and... You know, like, they're going to be hungry because, you know, they want to actually make the playoffs. And, you know, like, they were both there last year. So it's one of those where they should be there. And, yeah, it, it's I, – I just don't see this team being able to figure it out in time. Well, enjoy the week's reprieve from losses. That's all I can say, Matt. Yeah, well, and that's the thing, like, especially, like, once the deals were actually made, then we actually have something interesting to talk about. Then there'll be some excitement, because we get to see what the future looks like. Right now, it, we're just... We're in this holding pattern of, uh, okay, now what? 
and waiting for the sort of Damocles to fall and you know it's kind of like we're waiting for Godot and you know just waiting and waiting and waiting and eventually we'll get there but <laughs> yeah it, it just this interstitial spot is a little bit of a drag until we can actually have something to talk about again well Matt I will see you on the 8th of February at Bow River Brewing and we'll have lots to talk about that night one way or the other and we'll see you and whoever else wants to come and hang out. Yep, and as always, go Flames go, even if they're new people. <laughs> Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.